Nick, your latest film, Blurred, is based on a TV series called Conviction, and it's written by Bill Gallagher. Now, it's about two policemen brothers who kill a murder suspect and have to investigate the crime themselves. And when Bill wrote the TV series about eight years ago now, he talked about the fact that we lived in very angry times. How do you see today, and how do you see Blurred fitting in now? Well, a lot of the anger that there was in... I haven't seen the series, actually. I haven't actually seen it. Um, once I got sent the script... Uh, by which time I thought well, actually better, I better not read the I uh, better not watch the original episodes. Um, a lot of what the, uh, the anger that was in the original um, scripts is actually not there anymore. I, I found it less. I know it's I know it it exists in our society and I find you know, we see it all the time. Um, but I found that less interesting as a motivating factor for the central characters. And and so Bill and I switched the emphasis much more onto, onto being pushed by familial expectation and the the, the pressures of family and the, and the pressures of um, of uh, tradition and the expectations of his community and things. Um, that 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 would be what drives the the, the the two the two brothers. I thought just having um, these things pushed through anger was was uh, had, had been done in other projects very well apparently very well in conviction which was obviously a very popular thing but I think also Sunni Lumet's The Offence and these sort of these sort of films that had done this I what I hadn't seen is people doing bad things for good reasons and I think this this idea of of us as humans being willing to commit sin for the love of others or for the sake of loyalty and and and, and I think I found that quite interesting this sort of Orwellian idea of uh, I mean Orwell Orwell and his wider writing is not Orwell as in Big Brother you know <laughs> no, it's a very emotive and sensitive subject that you're dealing with. Well, several of them are, aren't they? The fact that you've got a young girl murdered here, a 12-year-old girl. There's, the main suspect is a, a local sex offender. Of course, you've got the actions of the two policemen brothers. And then you've got the fact that their father, as well as, as an ex-policeman, police chief, and mm -hmm. it talks about the way things used to be, kind of a bit more mm -hmm. vigilante justice, mm -hmm. and also that he's suffering from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Do all those kind of things add an extra level of responsibility or maybe a burden even when you're a director dealing with them sensitively i think i didn't want to be i didn't didn't want to be guilty of of the very thing that the film um admonishes and the, the film the film frowns on um yes you don't want to be prurient about the, the the subject but however it was important that i felt that i wanted the audience to be party to the animosity they feel for the for the Bewley character played by ben crompton um, as you say, the the, the sex offender. The, the, it was important the audience felt that anger too, um, and I I, I I didn't want that. You can't just be too cliche about that. You can't just lay down the sort of well, he he's a sort of um, usual standard weirdo. So I wanted to present something that that they could actually you know, evidence that they could they could unpack and conclude themselves, rather than us being too front up with it. So the the evidence we find in his flat, the the his behaviour, the comments he makes that actually I gather all these things up myself as an audience and then can make my conclusions. And I think that um, it gets the audience's hands dirty a, a bit, really. And, and so, if, so if the brothers are acting from this, uh, based on this sort of uh, um, impotence to not be able to do anything about this guy, um, then to a great, to a greater or lesser extent, the audience are guilty of that as well. And that, 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 that was quite, that was quite uh, so that you have to handle that sort of thing del delicately. You can't be too on the nose with it. I, I, don't, I don't shy away from the the potential sensitivities of this subject generally. I used to make documentaries about things that equally every bit as every bit as horrible as this, and uh, I think I've got form in in handling those sorts of areas with 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 with, uh, with, with sensitivity. And I don't think uh, the film can be many things, but I don't think it handles that in an insensitive way. I don't think it uh, it doesn't farm that that misery. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you about your work in documentaries and also factual drama as well. How do you think that's fed into making Blood? I'm never really aware too much of 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 my learning. I I, I, I think uh, any more than I am of my influences in, in a way. I I I, um, I just make the film I see, and I, and it seems I'm getting better. You know, I, I I don't know how it affects it. I think there is a. I know when I'm cheating, and I stop it. And I know when I'm cheating as a narrative. I know when performances aren't aren't believable. But funnily enough, when you're making a documentary. Um, filming people in everyday life, you see the same sort of things. I don't believe that. I don't believe, I just get a feeling that person did that because I was here. And your nose for that, the antennae you have for those sorts of moments, um, and truth and fairness and things, they just get a little bit sharper. And as a, when you're judging a performance, and that's an awful lot of what a director does, is judges and tweaks and assesses, um, you, they, they, that you, you get more attuned to, to what is being, uh, what's, what's happening in front of you. You mentioned you know when you're cheating there. What kind of thing are you thinking of and, and what do you have to stop yourself doing maybe? 
Well, I think there's, there's I, I always say it's never the actor's job to make things dramatic. And um, it's the writer's job and the director's job to make, it, to make things dramatic. And occasionally the, the composers, you know, to, to, to set a mood. But it's not the actor. The actor is supposed to make the scene work and, and will work together to make the scene plausible. And if I believe that, that's fine. And if it's about something that is dramatic, then it'll be dramatic. Um, and I, whenever I get a sense that the, the character is helping the filmmaker, um, I step in. If I, if, if I, and it's not because the actors have done something wrong, but I think it's, it, it, it's just something you need to watch for. Um, if you give away things too obviously, if you give away things too subtly, if it's it, that sort of, um, um, th those sorts of rules. And also, audiences don't like to be messed with. You can, you can, you can f confound their expectations by a turn of narrative, but don't cheat. And I remember doing, when I was doing The Awakening, we always talked about the bird in the woods moment, which we made sure wouldn't be in the. F we would never have a bird in the woods moment, and it's where it's where something comes out of the, uh, you know, and frightens the audience and everything. Okay, you got me, but I feel cheated, and I think in every in every genre there are similar sort of things. You, you know, you, okay, that was funny. The guy fell over. Yeah, okay, but it hasn't contributed to the comedy of the of the piece. It's just a it's just a pratfall, and that's that, that's and that's cheating. So there is a, in extrapolating that into drama and the, the psychological thriller. There is, there are similar sort of cheats that one has to avoid. You can't um, to make, you know, just say, well, you're trying, you made that exciting, but actually, it turns out it wasn't exciting. You just, you just delivered it like it was exciting, and that's, and I feel cheated, you know. You mentioned uh, the Awakening there, which of course was your first feature mm -hmm. film with Rebecca Hall and Dominic West in the leads. How have you found the experiences change with making this now your second feature, Blood? It's very hard, actually. I, again, I don't know. I don't know. What, how I, I don't know my learning curve and I, I, never, I never consciously I'm sure we're all the same in every, all our careers I never consciously think hang on I won't do that because back then mm. I did, I, you know it, the, these things just sort of bubble down much as you were influences as a film your influ influences as a filmmaker they you watch movies they bubble down the bits you admire stick the bits you don't don't and um, I don't sit on set thinking I'm going to do this because um, because Brando did it or I'm going to do this because you know whatever um, any more than you say, I'm going to do this because last time on The Awakening it worked and I did this. I, I, just, I just make the film I see in my head. And I, I, I think everybody can see a film in your head. If I tell you a story, you will see the film in your head. I just think I, just think I happen to be pretty good at, at executing that and turning that into, um, into a film perhaps you know, um, well enough to satisfy a number of people anyway. So. And on Blood, you're working with a number of people you've worked with before, aren't you? You've got uh, Stephen Graham in there as one of the two cop brothers, and you worked with him, of course, very successfully on the Iraqi war drama um, Occupation. What was it like working with him this time on Blood? Steve is, is, a, is a beautiful, amazing man. I mean, he, he is completely intuitive. He very, uh, he understands very well his the the sense of his approach. He doesn't get too bogged down in the in the uh, the ephemeral discussions around it. He talks about person, people, motive. What is it? They, 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 he doesn't come up from a sort of literary point of view, um, and nor is he ashamed about that. He he trusts his approach, and he's so on it. He was so sharp for the shoot, and so able to just produce stuff that he didn't see coming, we didn't see coming, and he, he keeps that tap open. Um, and it, I was saying the other day, the mark, a mark of Stephen's quality is it, act for actors in a world where actors are not slow to point out their doubts about the talents of their colleagues, should we say. Um, I've never met an actor that doesn't have the utmost respect for Steve. He's just got his, his Steve, Steve Graham's method of acting is Steve Graham's method of acting, and and yet it produces a huge array of different characters. It produces a liveliness on screen that is just very unfathomable. And I never know whether when I see him on screen, I never know whether I want the character to be my best friend or he's going to kill me. I can't, I can't, I can't work it out. And I think that's a, that's an amazing quality to to, to, to have. And it certainly sounds like he's a very kind of visceral or instinctive actor. Mm. Um, do you find that's how you are as a director as well, very instinctive? I think you need to keep your ears open when you're a director. I think this does stem from documentaries. You shoot with your ears, really. And I and uh, when something happens, you've got to be ready to use it and and go with it if it's better than the idea you had. Um, I see my job as a director to make the is to make the writer's ideas better, even if I'm the writer, um, and to illuminate those ideas. Um, and everybody else's is to illuminate my ideas. 
and to, to, to do that. But similarly, along the way, they will improve on them, and I've got to be ready when that happens. And, and if you're going to work with a decent cast, of which Steve and Paul, Bettany and Mark Strong and Brian Cox, I mean, for God's sake, if you've got those four people on screen and you're not going to listen to things they bring to it, um, go home. Or, you know, get, hire some mannequins. You know, just, I mean, you don't need those guys. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm instinctive in the, in the way I can, I can respond to what I, to what I see. And, I, and I'm energetic like Steve. Both Steve and I, I mean, I seem subdued now, but when I'm, when I'm working, I'm a bloody nightmare. I'm like, Sh you know, it's a, sit down, you know, just sit down. Um, I'm in everyone's face, everyone's <laughs> fiddling with their work. You know, the art department is saying, just let us do the, sorry, you know, I, I'm all over the place um, and, and the control freak. But I, 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 but I, yeah, but it all, I suppose I am. I, I like to think intuitive. I think if you come at it too academically, I think the films feel academic. And I think, however, um, I don't think any, any great film was made by somebody that wasn't listening. How would you describe um, Paul Bettany's acting style? Because obviously he plays Stephen Graham's brother and there's the other cop. Mm. When I first spoke with Steve, uh, with, with Paul Bettany about the script, I was, I was amazed how um, script-based he was. He was so analytical about the actual text and had such incredibly smart things to say about the existing text. Um, and and I, ex I expected that uh, cerebral analysis to continue on set, but to his credit, he, he worked a bit like Rebecca Hall as well, actually. Paul was able to, uh, having, having worked that academic line out and the, the, the theoretical line of his character out, and we talked at length about it, and we'd analyze the text and look at what's there, and I don't allow any lines to be changed, even if I haven't written it. I don't allow any lines to change. We say what's on the page. It's, 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 it's the only way of working. If you don't trust the script, don't do the film. Um, and yet, once we're on set, he put that away and he just take, took on this intuition for the part. And he is to marry that with, with um, a, a, a fantastic sense of where it is in the story, the overview. I had very little needed, very little briefing about where it fitted in, the pace we were coming out of one scene into the other. He was across, he knew, he remembered, he would, he would know the questions to ask because he is, in a way, making the film in his head. It's, it was astonishing. And, and to do that and deliver the, the, the emotionality and the, the psychology of his character while also having this astonishing technical grasp where you'd ask him, okay, I'm afraid for technical reasons I need you to do that, but you need to do that there because we've got no light and I need you just to lean into it, otherwise your eye doesn't go sharp. Okay, fine. Um, and self-governing on, on, on those sort of technical points, it was just superb. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of lovely actors. And, uh, and, and many of whom I've remained friends with. But I, I just love Paul Bettany, okay? I'll say it. I, I, I love him. I love his wife a bit more. Um, he knows I'm only getting to get close to her. But the, um, no, uh, we just got on very well. We were now very close friends because um, we both, I don't know, just clicked. We, 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 we clicked. He, um, you know, he needs a massive mind like mine to support him. <laughs> Can you see him becoming part of the Nick Murphy posse and being in a next film, a next I, series? I should be so lucky. I should be so lucky. I, I, you know, I, I always end a project thinking, no, don't go, everyone. I want to make another one. You know, Mark, come back. I mean, Mark Strong is just the, you know, the, the, the officially the nicest man in the business. Not only is he just beautiful acting. I mean, what a talent. What a talent we've got. Um, and I, you know, Mark, you know, he, just, he just goes from strength to strength. I was absolutely blown away when he took the part, delighted. Um, I want them all, I want them all. I want Brian Cox and he's, he, <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't want me probably. Actually, we've got on very well, I have to say. But uh, and I want them all and I get very, I was very, very um, it's very exciting to learn a new cast. It's very exciting to take on new, new oh my gosh, yeah. But um, your first instinct when you pick up a script is could my friends, could my friends do it? You know, <laughs> can Paul do it? Um, Paul and I would love to work together. We're, 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 we're in talks at the moment. And, um, you know, we, we'd, lo we'd love to, you know, be announcing something reasonably soon. But, the, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's ongoing. And I, I think you've got to be a bit careful. Don't use the same people, because some of the best people I've ever worked with, you know, I, I wasn't aware of before I, you know, before I had them. I guess for crew particularly. Um, so you've got to be a bit careful. You can't be too prescriptive, because, you know, there was a time in which I hadn't worked with Stephen Graham, there was a time in which I haven't worked with Jimmy Nesbitt or Rebecca or Dominic West or the actors I've loved working with. Michael Sheen, I didn't really know about Michael Sheen until I cast him and now you know, I would just run back to him at uh, any opportunity. You know. And Aid Edmondson making an appearance again after Chernobyl as well? 
I love it. Well, Aidan and I have remained friends. Uh, um, and um, and uh, we, we have a same, similar sort of... Um, boyish simplicity to us we don't you know we don't, we don't talk about much sense you know we don't we don't make much sense when we meet um uh you know i, I the, he he did a drama for me my first drama really about chernobyl um which nobody's seen but uh, the industry has seen and it's off the back of that that i i i, I end up getting the work i did early on um and he was so amazing in that adrian Evanson is a is a is a very funny boy of course but just the most sensitive and, and delicate of actors and in this this one scene he has in this film is just um it's heartbreaking and 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 pathetic and that's not easy to do with with five lines and he's just an extremely gifted boy and uh I'd love. I'd always. I'd always have him back. You know, if, if he'll have me. <laughs> and Daniel Pemberton as well, making another appearance as your well, not appearance on screen, no. but the music there, isn't it? His score, you can hear it again. Mm. Worked with him on the Awakening. Of course, your documentaries as well. How has mm. that relationship kind of grown over the years? Well, you get very sec very intuitive relationship. You, you, there's a lot you don't need to say, and you, but the you know the, obviously the shorthand everybody would expect that. But actually, there's also you can get pretty robust with each other because you kind of know you love each other. So you can, he can send through a track and I can come very hard back at him. I don't have to do the sort of, you're high, uh, very encouraged and all that. I can go, you can go in um, quite heavy. No, other direction, Jesus, you know, and, and we, we the, the score took a sort of um, evolution during this. It was much more, it started out much more of a sort of prefigured, uh, portentous feeling of, of, of forewarning and foreboding of events. Um, and then we pulled it during the edit. Really, we pulled it much more into the present, into the into the thriller present, as the tension tightened up. Tightened up, and we found it working much better. Um, and if you need a good relationship for that to to survive that. It's quite a process to say, look, actually, you and I love that track, but let's be honest, it it doesn't do this moment as well as as we as we need it to now, um, because we've changed what that scene is doing, and um, and that's a natural part of the process. But he's uh, he's. Uh, you know, mop head, lunatic, he just <laughs> terrible taste in clothes. And, um, but he, he's, he's a funny, great, great guy to work with. And we recorded at Abbey, Abbey Road Studios and to mix there and I think mm. surrounded by all that. So it's just, you know, I've died and gone to heaven. I, can't, I have to pinch myself. I think somebody's going to wake up. Literally, I just utterly brilliant and mesmerizing to stand in an auditorium, or stand in one of those recording studios with a 50 piece orchestra and just hear the sound. It just, it, um, but he's he's great because he piles in loads of weird shit as well. Um, uh, he he adds you know strange you know distorted things and ebos electrical ma electromagnets running making the guitar string, string strings quiver and stuff that puts that he puts then through this the, the orchestral strings and that sort of stuff. Um, so he's never quite content to just leave it as it is and say, yes, here's a piece of classical music. He, he's always got the Daniel Pemberton bonkers sort of <laughs> left field additions to it, some of which I allow and some of which I, uh, I, uh, and I, I some of which I allow and I'm in awe of and others I think, let's, uh, let's save that for another one, you know. <laughs> uh, polite way of saying, forget about it. Do you think you can sort of be a bit more um, I don't know, innovative or out there when making a feature film with the music? Or is, is that change from when you've been making TV programmes, whether they be factual or, 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 or drama? Um, I think there's a great deal of freedom in music for factual, actually. I think they're far more interested in the, the executive at level. They're far more interested in storytelling and, what, and what they, how, the, how the, the facts have been communicated and things. Um, in drama, no, I wouldn't say, actually. I haven't noticed a huge difference. I think there's a great deal more time you get to get it right. Um, and to hone it and to, to uh, reassess in film. But uh, no, in television, I had an amazing experience on Occupation. I had a tremendous set of producers, a tremendous support from the channel, great loyalty, great loyalty from Kudos. Um, so, uh, and a first class producer who was able to sort of back me and, and, uh, and you know, support us in that. So, um, no, I haven't noticed it. I dare say when you are doing the music for a, a, a block series, I think they probably do come infringed by that. I, and I was aware doing um, an ITV show that there was, a, there was a set palette, and fair dues, of course there is. You're only, you're only the director in those circumstances. You're not, you're not the show. You know, the, the, the kids come and watch Primeval for, for what they know of the show, and they don't need me there sort of, I'm changing everything, I'm doing some avant-garde, sort of, you know, th that's not what they're there for, and, and directors should just know their place in those circumstances, and, and I certainly 
I certainly did. But when you're making a, a film from the ground up, where you're creating and building the world, then I think I'm much more, uh, much more I feel within my rights to say, right, this is the, this is the landscape. The, uh, the auditory landscape. Talking about moving from the small screen to the big screen has been quite a tradition of, you know, TV series that have made it onto the big screen. Mm. You think of the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, we've mm. had State of Play, Edge of mm. Darkness, uh, The Singing Detective, Traffic as well even, mm. and of course obviously with Blood. What do you think makes a successful transfer from the small screen to the big screen? Um, narrative needs to remain tight. Uh, it, it, it's the... Um, the the it get can get they can get too chaotic when they try and bring too much with them. Invariably, you're talking about a television series that was five hours becoming two or eight, ninety minutes, and in the condensing, they are uh, they are tr they try to they try to salvage too much, and I think uh, and your narrative becomes too cluttered. Um, and uh, you know you, you just need to be brutal about it. It's like adapting a book. If you write if you adapt a two hundred page book, you're gonna miss. 60% of the book, it's not going to be there, you know, that's the truth of it. And the same goes for a TV, TV adaptation. Um, you need to be a bit brutal. And you've named some cracking examples there, and you've, met, you've named some examples which were less successful. And I think those, if I had to typify what had happened, I, you know, if, uh, without analysing it too closely, I'd imagine that's what's happened. And what's next for you? You mentioned that you were talking with Paul about possibilities for the future. Mm. Well, it's a strange business. A lot I can't say. It's odd. I, there's... A, there's I'd love to say, oh my God, it's such a great idea. Oh my God, I think, I just think. Um, just do it. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot I'm not allowed to. And, uh, and that's because genuinely it's not lit. It's not up and running. We don't know what it is quite yet. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not that I'm just being coy and you wait, there's going to be a press release. It's going to blow you away. It's not, we're not that close. Um, I'm doing a US TV series called Rogue. Uh, in, in a few weeks, which will, which will, which will be great. I'd love to, I'm dying to work with Tandy Newton. And I'm a huge fan of hers. And, um, and she's supposed to be a lovely woman, which is, believe it or not, very, very important. I don't like to work with um, horrible people. Um, I'll never cast them again. Um, uh, yes, cut to me having a nightmare with one of them, you know. Um, but that's the intention anyway. So I'll do that, and then the new year, we'll see, we'll see if this thing can, can get off the ground. And, uh, I just, I, you know, also, you know, there's things I want to write, and, and there's, there's things people want me to write. So I'll... I'll keep myself busy that way until uh, something presents itself. What kind of genres are, you, are we looking at? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, I want to make 20 films in 20 genres and then I want to go to bed. And, and I don't know what they are. And my, my heroes, are, I have a few of them, but Sidney, Sidney Lumet is my, um, as a director, is my primary thing because I think his efficiency and, and, and accuracy of what story he was telling and why was so sharp. Um, and yet he made films in all sorts of genres, um, uh, you know, so, so I don't know, I don't, I, you know, will it be another horror? I don't, I doubt it next. Will it be another psychological thriller? I doubt it next, you know, will it be American Pie 7? <laughs> I doubt it, uh, but I don't know, I don't know, you know. The, another reunion, <laughs> this reunion again! Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I try not to say when I when I, because I, I wait until the scripts get sent, and I think there's a, there's a there's a necessity. You need to pick a little bit because because the Hollywood system and the British system look a little bit of what's been done, and can he do something for us? So they're not going to just throw a comedy at me, and, I, and, and, and nor do I welcome one um, quite yet. But um, I don't want to be too prescriptive at this stage. I think that's crackers because you end up boring yourself as much as anything else. And are you looking at writing yourself again, or or directing other people's scripts? Yeah, I'd like I'd like to. I'd li I like doing both. I, 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 every time I write my own, direct, every time I direct my own script, I think, oh, I like this. This is great because you can start to direct while you're writing, um, and there are huge benefits to that, and huge economies of scale apart from anything else, but huge benefits creatively. And yet, I pick up a script of somebody else's, a decent one, uh, and there are plenty that aren't. Um, but like the the, the the script for Blood and uh, the script for occupation you think well this is why would i write why would i need to write this is this is first class stuff and and um subsequently you know i think oh, I, I know I'll, i don't want to don't write my own this time i enjoy the discovery because you have to discover a text and you look, keep going back to the text what is in there what is in there and that's a very different process for a director than knowing exactly what's in there already because you put it in you know. We look forward to seeing what comes from you next, Thank whether that's you your own creation and true writing or directing someone else's piece. And lots of luck with Blood, of course, too. Thanks very much for having me.